Hello, good morning or good afternoon to a few of you. Thank you so much for being here for the NOCO Road Weather Management Peer Exchange. I'll just start off with a few um, words. We uh, are starting this new Agile Peer Exchange format at the Center of Excellence. So basically, you already noticed um, in our agenda, this will be a shorter event. So we have three hours today. We have a few plenary sessions and then we have a few um, discussion sessions. So basically, if you have questions, we'll have the opportunity for you to raise your hand and actually ask the question. And we want this to be as interactive as, as possible. So um, uh, with that, I just want you, oh, my name is Lana Brashears. I will be the technical staff helping facilitate this peer exchange today. I work with ITE and I work with the Center of Excellence as well. But I will give it over to Faisal Salim, our center director, for some welcome and introduction. Thank you, Luana, and likewise, uh, greetings and uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, or good evening to, to all of you. Some of you may be in the evening field right now. Right. So um, again, you know, welcome to the National Operations Center for Excellence uh, Peer Exchange on Road Weather Management. I'd like to extend a special greetings um, and welcome to Trond Hovland and um, Jenny Simonson from uh, Norway. So it's pretty late for you. So thank you for uh, joining us today. And by the way, congratulations to you also on the great performance by Casper Rudd at the US Open. I know that he lost in the finals, but uh, he did pretty well. Uh, so congratulations to you on that. Um, so this topic of road weather management is of uh, immense interest to our TISMO stakeholders here in the United States. And uh, in support of that, the center has, uh, through its uh, technical advisory committee, uh, demonstrated its commitment uh, to this very important topic and initiative. And uh, we have organized a peer exchange in 2019. Um, in addition, uh, through our collaboration with Federal Highway and thanks to Federal Highway Administration for launching the Road Weather Management Webinar Series, so Road Man Weather Management Spotlight Webinar Series, sorry. So that, and that is going very well. So as uh, Luana said, uh, today's uh, peer exchange is unique, that this is our first agile peer exchange. Uh, it's a shorter version and also we we just invite a smaller group of uh, subject matter experts. So we thank you for, for joining us today and helping us with our peer exchange. I'd like to profoundly thank Luana Brochures for leading the planning and organization of this uh, peer exchange. Thank you, Luana, for all your efforts. Also, my gratitude to David Johnson, Tony Covent Coventry, and Tracy Scriba from Federal Highway Administration for uh, their guidance throughout uh, the planning phase. And also, Tony and David, uh, thank you for presenting today. Uh, we were also very thankful to Dave Huff from South Dakota DOT. Dave is a national leader in road weather, weather management, and he himself volunteered to help out. So thank you, Dave, and thank you for presenting again. And um, finally, Thanks to our internal NOCO team, Doug Noble, um, definitely a uh, very integral part of our team. And uh, he is uh, going to monitor, moderate one of the sessions. Adam Hobbs is our technical lead, uh, technical and communications lead with the center. Tom Kern for introducing uh, the Norway team. Uh, so thank you all. Uh, finally, thank you for all of, all of you who are joining us today. And uh, we can look forward uh, to exciting um, discussion that can benefit the larger road weather management community. With that, I would like to hand back to Luana. Luana, take it from here. All right, thank you, Faisal. So what I'm gonna go now, I'll just go through our agenda for today. So we just have, um, like I mentioned before, three modules, so you, you hear great presentations. The first one from Federal Highway on their road weather management perspectives and initiatives. And then you'd hear from ITS Norway on their perspective on ITS and metrology. And then finally, we'll have a presentation with a state perspective and also 
uh, some NCHRP initiatives related to road weather management um, in, in the United States. And as I mentioned before, we'll try to make this as interactive as possible. So we'll have um, a first, after the two first presentations, we'll have a quick Q&A session. And you can, like I said, just raise your hand and then we'll, we'll make um, you be able to unmute and then ask your questions to our speakers. And also we'll have a breakout room in the end of this few exchange just to try to get the conversation going and understand a little more uh, what you're doing in road weather management, what are your issues, um, what are some success stories that you have to share with the group. And then we'll just wrap up the day um, at about 2 p.m. Eastern time. And so with that, we'll go ahead and start with our first presenters uh, from Federal Highway Administration. So they will talk about road weather management program initiatives. We have Dave Johnson and Tony Coventry today with us. Uh, you probably mostly already know them, but I'll let them introduce themselves as, as we go. And with that, David and Tony, uh, that's all yours. <laughs> Great, thanks, Luana. And uh, I, I think I'm going to start off and then uh, hand over some sections to David. We sort of divvy up uh, what we do. So I'm Tony Coventry. Most of you know me. I uh, work for the Road Weather Management Program at Federal Highway Administration. So we wanted to give you a little bit of an update or sort of overview of what we do at the Road Weather Management Program. <clears throat> so the first one, of what we kind of break things down into programs that we manage and run that are operational. And then we also have our research area that we do research for the community, and then we do outreach and training. So those are the three components. But we thought we'd start with some of the programs. The, the first one is the weather data environment, which many of you probably are familiar with. Um, next slide, slide, Luana. And the weather data environment is actually a national repository for different states' ESS data or their environmental sensing station data. So any ROS data, whether it's from a fixed site ESS or a mobile or a mobile sensor on a truck, comes into a database that the weather the weather management program manages and um, provides so that the states can share that data across borders. Um, this is a kind of big program. Some of you might remember this started as Claris more than 10 years ago and has gone through several, several iterations, but now it's an important part of data that is used not just by the, the operational agencies, but also by the research community to take this data and look for new opportunities to develop <clears throat> new solutions and technologies using the data. So this is an important part of the program. It feeds into a lot of different areas of research that we're, we're doing right now. Um, the key most important thing is that um, as we're getting the data in, we check to make sure that it's good quality data <clears throat> so that it's useful and accurate and valid as it goes out to the research community. Um, even the private sector can use this data. All this data is open source for anybody to use as part of their solutions that they provide to the road weather community. <clears throat> so next slide. So I mentioned it feeds into something bigger. And so this is the next set of data sets that we're looking at in terms of the federal highway, where we're gonna combine multiple data sets into what we're calling managing disruption of operations data or MDO data. And so if you look at the items on the left, you can see the road weather is one of those contributors to this data set. But it also will include things like traffic incidents, accidents or crashes basically, and work zones. And if you notice, and, and other data sets, but most of these data sets are non-recurring data sets, things that disrupt our operations, not all the time, but just whenever they actually happen. So we wanted to capture all that data in, in one sort of data set so you can run queries and sort of determine how they interact with each other. So for example, did this accident happen because of road weather? Or did this incident happen because of a work zone? Or was there a work zone, road weather, and, and multiple things that created this? So that researchers can take this data <clears throat> and apply it to operational things to improve uh, what we're doing in terms of developing solutions and maybe technologies um, to mitigate some of the uh, disruption to operations. So this is the next step of what we wanna do. And then we wanna be able to provide this data like we do with just the weather data environment to the entire community, everybody from law enforcement response, emergency management response, um, the DOTs, operations, how they do things from a traffic perspective, everything um, that you want to use this kind of data for, that the DOTs can use this data for operationally. So the development of those apps are still in the process and we'll see how they, they come out in the future, but this is the next planned stage. 
And this is why we keep the weather data environment because it'll be a key component to it. So next slide. So the next program that we work on is Pathfinder. Next slide. So this, why, why Pathfinder? So Pathfinder started uh, like seven, 2017, 2018, part of EDC three, it might've been before then. But the challenge at the time was that messaging to the motorists sometimes would be conflicted. So the DOTs or the operational agencies will put one message out to motorists, but then the National Weather Service might put a different message out. And sometimes they weren't the same message and motorists and the public would could, could get confused from time to time about what's really gonna, gonna happen here. And it's important that the public and motorists know what's gonna happen so that they can make the right decisions, right? And then it's important that the message is the same to keep it from confusing. So at the time we developed this Pathfinder program. <clears throat> Next slide, Luana. And the idea about Pathfinder is basically it's collaboration. It's the, what, the, the National Weather Service, the state DOTs, local agencies, emergency management, even the private weather service providers all get together when there's an event and make sure that their messaging is the same. Make sure that they understand what the forecast is gonna be, what the impacts are gonna be, and then develop the message together and then make sure that the messaging goes out that's the same. So that's the idea um, behind Pathfinder. So what we provide as part of this Pathfinder is <clears throat> technical assistance. So we just completed a uh, Pathfinder workshop for the state of Alaska. And they're in the process of completing that, putting their whole their entire um, Pathfinder program together where they're collaborating with the National Weather Service and the DOT. And I think up next, I think Maine is the next state that's looking to develop a Pathfinder program. So what we do is we try to support that. We provide all the information about different case studies, fact sheets, and then we hold a workshop with the local, DO, the local DOT divisions and the operators as well as the local National Weather Service agency offices to make sure that they're aligned in what's gonna happen. And we come up with a plan, a working Pathfinder document. And the key here is that every state is a little bit different, not just climatically, you know, Alaska obviously is different than Kentucky, but op organizationally they're different, different way they're set up with different divisions, different way they're set up with supervisors and how they make decisions and different ways the National Weather Services are, are are organized. So trying to combine those things and make those things work is almost state by state is completely different. So that's, we sort of support um, trying to develop these uh, Pathfinder programs. I think there are more than 25 states now that have Pathfinder programs in place for severe weather. All right, so the next thing is WRMS. So this program was part weather responsive management strategies and this was part of EDC5, the most recent one. And the idea was that we would or identify um, weather responsive management strategies or technologies or solutions that could be deployed across the country. So if one state had done this and it could be useful someplace else, we would, we would be able to support uh, deploying that same strategy elsewhere. Um, and the other idea was we could take all of these things that we learned in the past, like um, mobile data, how do we use that in, in the next strategies and put that into these new strategies <clears throat> for future for future use. Next slide. So here's just a list of them, some of the traffic management strategies. So motor advisory and warning systems, and this could be based on real time weather data. In other words, hey, the road is slick, so the speed is slower now, and warning motorists in real time of what the conditions are out there. Um, signal timing and ramp meter metering. That's obvious. Um, variable speed limits. Again, various variable speed limits could be based on weather conditions as well, not just traffic, but also what the weather conditions are to the road. Um, road and lane closures, traffic diversion, um, vehicle restrictions. So if you're in a freeze thaw situation, you might not wanna have heavy trucks on your roads while you have that situation, it can be damaging. And then the bigger thing for us operationally is the maintenance management strategy. So some of the anti-icing and de-icing, snow plow, removal, warning systems. The picture on the right the, is, a, is Arizona DOT has a dust warning system where they put together in, instruments that detect whether there's gonna be an issue and then can warn motorists to um, not go on that road or to pull over. So those kinds of strategies uh, are part of the w, WRMS strategy. Next slide. And this is just a list of some of the deployments of these types of strategies across the country. 
um, in addition to the Arizona one that's not on this list, we should update this list and include that. But some of these are are like uh, snow route optimization and um, expanding ARWIS, uh, you know, which makes more data available to use in terms of decision support for maintenance. Um, so these are just some of the ones that have gone out in the last couple of years, uh, programs out there, um, deployments. Next slide. So adaptive route optimization. So we're going to switch over into like our current research, what we're working on. And so just a little bit of background to give a little background, and then I'll hand it over to Dave to sort of tell you where we are with it right now. So the idea behind this is obviously weather is a huge impact on our transportation system. Everybody knows that it impacts our mobility and productivity and safety. It's over 200,000 people are injured and 4,000 people um, lose their lives to winter weather, adverse weather in the US every year. And we spend over $2 billion on snow and ice um, operations and over $5 billion on just fixing the impact that those operations have on our infrastructure. The chemicals that we use, the icing things and the strategies we use can, can impact our actual infrastructure and change that. So we wanna find some ways where we can be more efficient in our operations and minimize that impact. So that's where the first area that we wanted to, one of the things that we need to do is to fix. And then, um, so the idea is that we know that by having an accurate route or I think more relevant route because sometimes we have a route and it does it, you run it, but you didn't need to go there. But by having the accurate and route based condition information, um, it'll re, it'll uh, get us to recover the road faster and where we need to recover it, and, and be more efficient. It's less waste. And then, so by knowing that, next slide. Um, so the challenges are getting the roads treated and plowed efficiently, right? Staffing, training. Um, seasonality. Uh, the staffing is a big issue now in the U.S., making sure that you have enough um, operators to run snow plows and, and chemical um, spreaders, um, that you have the resources, salt, um, whatever it is you use for your operations, um, and understanding um, that there are going to be more extreme weather coming, and we need to be able to react to that. And then AVL is another thing, so vehicle location technology, knowing where our snow plows are, so that we can reposition them if we need to. Um, and then legacy routes, even some of our routes today that are fixed routes are, are not that effective. They could be done better. And sometimes that's because the sheds or the locations they go to to get fuel or chemical aren't always in the right location. Uh, and then of course, a big challenge is trying to expand the urban routes and also raise that level of service. Um, things like autonomous vehicles, are going to require a higher level of service during the winter in order to operate properly. So we know we know we need to improve that that capability. And with that, I think I'll hand it over to David to sort of give his perspective of what what does that really mean? What what does Arrow mean? And then how is it? What are we doing next with it? Thanks. Um, yeah. So just a little bit about adaptive route optimization. So th this was research that I piloted when I was in Colorado DOT. Um, that I wanted to bring over um, to Federal Highway. Really, the idea behind it is um, kind of changing the idea of historical routing and static routing um, for snow plows to combat um, snowstorms. Um, there's a lot of inefficiencies and reasons why we want to look at this, um, primarily because, as Tony mentioned, um, Material application is a very large budget uh, item for DOTs. It's very expensive. It's also not so great for the environment. So we wanna look at how we can improve applications of these, these chemicals on our roadways. And really we wanna look at adapting to geospatial weather conditions as they're um, you know, evolving over time. Um, one really good example uh, that I keep coming back to in my time in Colorado, is we would have snow squalls that come off the I-25 corridor, um, and you know they're very they're they're microclimate systems. So you have um, maybe a, a 10 mile stretch of I-25 that's getting about four inches of snow per hour uh, for a very short amount of time, like an hour, maybe 90 minutes. Just north and just south, east and west of that that small micro system is there's really no snow going on, but those snow plows continue to cycle. Um, on their historic routes because that's just kind of the way it's always been. So why not have those uh, snow plows surge into the area where there's um, 
a, a, a strong uh, snow squall going through, help clear out that roadway and then go back to their route. Uh, it's really about adapting to real-time conditions and that, that's kind of the emphasis about adaptive route optimization. We're gonna be talking about this a lot more. Um, we have an October 12th webinar that's gonna be hosted by NOCO um, during our Road Weather Spotlight webinar series. So if you're interested in learning more about the methodology and our phase one research for this, feel free to reach out to me, but there should be an announcement coming out from Adam um, um, for this October 12th webinar. Um, we will be continuing this research. There is a phase two. We're gonna be looking at um, market feasibility and readiness for this, understanding the fact that um, snow and ice and winter operations have been institutionalized at DOTs for decades. Um, so there's a large, um, you know, reluctance to look at changing something like that. There's going to be a large training component to it. There might even be a new system or tool that comes out of it, but we're not, we're not quite sure what that's going to look like in the future. Uh, right now, phase two is going to really involve our stakeholders or our agencies or DOTs looking at the concept of operations and our system requirements documents that we developed during phase one and improving on those um, we have a high level uh, uh, you know, system architecture documents right now. And we want state DOTs to take a look at those and see um, you know, what improvements they can make or what uh, you know, unique issues they might have that they'd wanna incorporate into the Aero project. Um, so look forward to that. Uh, next slide, please, Luana. Um, and this is just kind of a, a, a technical look at what we did during phase one. We did do a, a literature review, tech scan, and we also did early adopter interviews. Uh, there, like I said, there's a handful of DOTs that have broached this subject, not a whole lot. Um, so we wanted to interview those folks. Some of those were with cities and counties, but mostly they were with state DOTs. Um, and we took their inputs and looked at how we could um, and tie their needs into the concept of operations and the system requirements documentation. So again, we'll be talking about that more next month um, on October 12th. Uh, next slide, please. Integrated modeling for road condition prediction, I would consider to be one of our larger projects. Um, this is something that is now entering, well, it's, it's wrapping up phase four. Um, phase three, uh, the last phase was really uh, deployed in the, in the Kansas City Scout area. Um, the way I see IMRCP is it's uh, basically a, a maintenance decision support system or an equivalent to that for TMCs. The focus is really not so much on maintenance, but traffic, looking at uh, future modeling, traffic modeling, bottlenecks uh, based on weather conditions and predicted forecasting. Um, so this will give you information on where you can expect to see slowdowns, bottlenecks, queues. Um, and we're looking at, um, since work zone management is also under my purview, pulling in information on uh, live active work zones. You can see those on the, the orange icons as well as we want to bring in live incidents. So if there's accidents um, or crashes, I should say, pulling that information in and having that being fed into our metro traffic modeling algorithm. Um, and also one of the interesting things we developed during this last phase, phase, which was phase four, we deployed it in two new areas. Uh, one of them was the Ohio DOT. And there we were looking at um, winter, um, a winter focus. There's a little bit of um, you know, rain and, and freezing rain, that sort of stuff. But really it was, it was a winter focus in Ohio DOT. But we also deployed this in Louisiana DOT in the New Orleans area. Uh, we, we mapped out and, and um, uh, modeled all their, their primary main lines. And the focus on that was obviously non-winter. Um, emer emergency evacuation and response has kind of come out of this. Um, there's been some congressional funding tied to it, and that, that was one of the emphasis that they wanted us to research is, can we use this for things like emergency response for hurricanes, um, contra flow, um, that sort of stuff. So <clears throat> with that in mind, we, we deployed inundation modeling, inundation prediction based on storm surge modeling, um, but really we we're looking at hurricanes. So of course, as soon as we deploy this, we have a, a fairly light hurricane season. The last one was 
not not very strong. It's always difficult because a part of you wants to see a hurricane hit the area um, so that we can test out this research. But then another part of it is obviously, you know, we don't we don't want to see hurricanes um, really impact any of these areas. But that's really the the focus is um, non winter hurricane and emergency response. Um, so we will also be reporting on this in November. So it'll be the the webinar after our uh, adaptive route optimization webinar in October. Um, so there'll be more information on this. We're going to be continuing the research probably for one more phase. Um, and that's really to make it a uh, regional deployment. We're looking at deploying this on um, uh, you know, various states in, in, the, in the Southeast um, and also using uh, universities to uh, take a look at the research, improve upon it, um, a lot of uh, there, there's a few universities that also have their own TMCs, Alabama being one of them, the University at, at Tuscaloosa. So we're going to be deploying it in that area and letting them uh, take a look at it, use it, make decisions on it operationally and report back to us on what they'd like to see to improve upon um, on the system. So really the focus and the end user here is going to be your TMC operator. Um, looking at traffic modeling and where they may, might be able to implement things like um, key warning systems, variable speed limits, advanced messaging on VMS, that sort of stuff. Um, so uh, again, look for more information on that in November. I think we have one more slide, Lana, if you want to move forward. Again, I kind of jumped forward and talked about all this already, but really the focus on phase four was to look at um, uh, hurricane and emergency response for phase four. So that's what we looked at. Um, again, Louisiana was our primary target, but we, we are still looking at a winter focus uh, for IMRCP as well. Uh, next slide. And here's phase five that I mentioned earlier. So I guess I should uh, say next slide earlier. <laughs> All right, let's, let's go ahead and move on along. Uh, we did wrap up and looked at um, automated vehicles in adverse weather. Um, the final report is just about through the publication process, which is a whole nother uh, thing we could talk about. But um, look for the final report on, uh, we call it AVAW phase three. <laughs> it's about a 90 page report of really cool findings that we have from automated vehicles and adverse weather research. Um, here's kind of just a background and overview. We know that, um, and, and we talked about this under the data environment stuff, um, a lot of this data is going to be needed or will be used in automated and connected vehicles. Um, weather is just a part of the bigger picture that, that these systems are going to need to utilize. So um, why not start taking a look at, at um, how the technology uh, reacts to things like uh, whiteout conditions, uh, strong crosswinds, um, snowpack and icing like you see in the in the picture on the right um, and really looking to see if um, there's any issues and we did find quite a few um, with these these uh, SAE level twos uh, systems that, that we tested this testing took place up in Ohio and a lot of these conditions um, some of them were man-made but some of them we actually used um, you know natural conditions after a snowstorm uh, let's go ahead and go to the next slide I don't want to jump ahead again on this one um, so these, these are the phases of the project. Again, we, we just wrapped up phase three um, uh, late last year, and we're just now getting the final report through the publication process. Not sure what we're going to do with the future of this research. Um, this was actually done by another, um, by the, the Turner Fairbank Research Center, um, and we were there as technical support and uh, there for guidance as well. But as of right now, we don't have any additional uh, testing plan. Um, but we did do a webinar on this a while ago, and we have some really cool videos um, of the research and where the, um, the automated vehicles had difficulty with localization. Um, there was one uh, test run that we did where it ran into um, some work zone implements. Um, so some fairly interesting and somewhat concerning results came out of that. Um, so that's where we were on, on phase three. Once the final report comes out, we'll probably broadcast that through our newsletter, um, as well as maybe mention it in an upcoming webinar series. If there's enough interest, we'll do another follow-up webinar and showcase some of the videos again. Uh, next slide. And wrapping up, uh, here's some of our outreach and upcoming events. 
Um, again, we've mentioned this a few times, but we have the Spotlight Series. Uh, thanks to NOCO for hosting this. Um, generally, it's the first Wednesday of the month. Um, on, in October, it's going to be the second Wednesday on October 12th. <clears throat> we have a few focus areas that we like to look at. Primarily, maintenance and operation challenges are a big focal point. We also look at data sources and applications, as well as um, current research and innovations. If you have any ideas that you'd like to see or have any research topics, um, uh, feel free to reach out to us. We have the next few months planned out. Um, I'm not really sure how long we'll continue this, but the idea behind the webinar series was um, since we couldn't meet in person for such a long amount of time, we wanted to make sure that uh, we were still reaching out to the community of practice and showcasing some of the cool stuff that the community is doing. We also have a newsletter that we send out um, that you can uh, uh, get involved with. Generally, we send that out quarterly. <clears throat> we continue the Pathfinder. We also have the Capability and Maturity Framework workshops. Um, those have slowed down a little bit, but we do have a non-winter track for the CMF. So if, uh, if an agency is interested, feel free to reach out to us and we'd be happy to host something like that. But we do continue the Pathfinder workshop um, and as, as was mentioned earlier, Maine DOT is going to be um, the next uh, Pathfinder workshop. And we continue our engagement with the community through uh, TRB, uh, Aurora, Clear Roads, uh, the MDSS Pool Fund Study, as well as APWA and the National Weather Service. Some more upcoming events. We will be finally hosting an in-person stakeholder meeting in the spring of 2023. We're just now in the initial planning phases of that. Um, so uh, more details to come, but we're looking forward to finally getting folks in, in person to talk about some of the stuff. Um, again, we'll be uh, spotlighting uh, adaptive route optimization as well as integrated modeling for road condition prediction in our upcoming webinars. We have done a few collaborative efforts with NASA as well as um, our Office of International Programs on the 2024 solar eclipse. We'll probably doing, be doing more of those, but really it's a Pathfinder type event. Um, I was in Colorado DOT at the, during the 2018 solar eclipse and saw uh, some of the impacts of that. And really it's a Pathfinder event. It's just a uh, Pathfinder event where we know it's coming and we can plan ahead. So that's one nice thing about it versus weather predictions are not always accurate. So. Uh, we know this is coming. We've um, already talked with uh, our affiliates in Mexico as well as Canada, and we're going to be putting up um, some consistent messaging. Uh, really the, the same focus that we talked about with Pathfinder. Consistent messaging, making sure the public knows what to expect, um, and uh, getting ready for what's to come with traffic issues, crashes, that sort of stuff. We also have community engagement events coming up. Um, one in APWA, which Tony will be going to in Loveland, Colorado, and uh, the Friends of Aurora Conference coming up in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And with that, I think that's it. So that's kind of a brief, very brief overview that doesn't cover all our research or initiatives, but at least should give you <laughs> kind of an idea of what we're working on. So uh, Luana, I'll hand it back to you. Thanks. Thank you. And thank you so much, Tony and David. We know how busy you are and you're working on all those programs. Thank you so much for taking the time and share that with us. I really like that you mentioned that uh, the work you're doing, not only at the Winter Weather States, but also in Louisiana and Alabama and all the, all the all over the, the, the country. Very, very interesting. And also, it's, it's amazing to me to see the next steps for connected automated vehicles. So thank you so much. Um, as I mentioned before, if uh, you have any questions, uh, we will have a time. So what we we'll do now is go to our next presenters. And then after those presenters, we'll take a break. And after the quick break, we'll come back for a Q&A session followed by discussion. So if you have any questions to our presenters, feel free to uh, speak up after we come back from the break. Uh, also, a few people have been adding a few comments to the chat. So thank you for that. Also. Feel free to keep the conversation going there. So uh, from Washington State DOT, they mentioned that they have variable speed limit systems, uh, older variable speed limit systems across uh, some regions there. And Mike McPherson also mentioned about the I-77 system that's visibility-based, 
and it's a very uh, variable speed limit application. And Doug added a link there if you want more information on those. So with that, now let's move forward to our next presenters. We have our second module of the Peer Exchange and is a perspective on ITS and metrology. And we're very glad to welcome Jenny Simonson and Trav Hovland from ITS Norway. They have been uh, very uh, excited to participate and not only bring all their, their experience from uh, Norway weather to you, but also learn from you things that they can bring you back. So we hope that this is a very uh, interactive session. And with that, I'll let uh, Tron start and he will introduce himself. And then after that, Jenny will finalize with the video. Thank you, Leona. And uh, uh, thank you for having me on uh, this program. And uh, I am Tron Hovland. I am the managing director of uh, ITS uh, Norway. I've been with the ITS Norway for like 13 years. And uh, before that, I, I was uh, with the road administration in Norway, working on, uh, on similar things that uh, we saw in the, in the previous presentation. So I'm really excited to, to, to listen to it. Uh, so thank you. And also we can move one more forward. Uh, I, I just want to, to take you through a little bit about uh, how, we, how we see things in, in Norway. And, Realizing uh, while listening to the to, to the previous presentation, we also kind of picked uh, four different initiatives and projects that uh, we we want to mention. Uh, we could have done this differently, and uh, if the road administration had done this, it would have been different, uh, quite sure. But anyway, uh, if you move on one slide, uh, ITS Norway is uh, is a quite small uh, entity. We are like uh, eighty five members at the moment. Uh, we are eighteen years old. We we were uh, made in in the in the kind of in the mirror of uh, ITS America, so we have kind of some resemblance to to what they do. Uh, what we are really good at in uh, in ITS Norway is to run projects. So that's the main thing that we do in our, our organization, and we keep contact with with the European sister organizations, with, of which there is uh, twenty nine at the moment. So we have a kind of a really good connection to all over Europe. And also we keep contact with uh, Canada, United States, uh, uh, Japan, Korea. So we are also have a kind of a, a bigger view of, uh, of the ITS world. So uh, if you move on one slide, uh, Luana. Um, this is uh, unfortunately uh, one of the more common scenarios that we face uh, in Norway today. This is the major through fare from, uh, from north of Norway to south of Norway. And uh, the deviation is uh, also kind of underwater. So we have uh, increasingly problems with, with floodings and, and, uh, and severe weather. Next, please, uh, Rona. So what are, what are we kind of believe in man-made or not man-made, the climate change? Uh, the climate is at least in Norway, severely changed over the last decade. Uh, we have far more floodings, uh, landslides, avalanches, and rockfall than we used to. And uh, only uh, last year, we had more than 1,500 avalanches that crosses a road. And uh, this only like 10 days ago, we had a, a death injury uh, occurring from a, from a big landslide, uh, taking the lives of an old, uh, old lady. So it's quite severe, and, uh, and it, it is an in increasing. Most of these um, uh, kind of avalanches, landslides, and rockfalls are, are coming in new locations. So old protection installations that we that we had for years, we even name our avalanches and landslides because they come every year. But now it's not it's impossible to do that. They came, they come uh, any place they kind of please, and uh, and also our our installation is too weak and in the wrong place. So we have a lot to do. So um, the challenge that we face now is to increase on monitoring, warning, and prediction to save lives. And uh, to do that, we, uh, we work uh, increasingly more cross-agency and cross-specialist teams to gain a deeper insight. And uh, if you move on uh, to one more, I want to, to go through uh, four kind of initiatives here, NIFS, AVAD, uh, Orchestra, and, and PRA um, kind of um, projects. These are, are picked because they are like, gives a background on how to work for the future. So if we kind of go to the first one, uh, if, we, if you go one more slide. 
Uh, this is uh, the NIFS uh, that translate into scary in English. It stands for um, for uh, nature danger or uh, danger based uh, on the natural happenings, infrastructure floodings and uh, and landslides. It is um, it is a, a project that was started in 2012, and even then it was based on a on a governmental white paper that was called How to Live with Danger. So that means that already more than a decade ago we we were aware of the changes that. Uh, uh, that we were facing in the future. So the two first bullets uh, on the left side here, we want to have a safer society with a more robust infrastructure. And we also will want, want to reduce the, and prevent accidents and damage as a result of landslide and floodings and everything. So uh, our railroad department and, uh, and uh, energy and water directorates and the road administration teamed up to do this uh, cross-agency cooperation and one of the results that came out of that was, uh, was a platform of collaboration that still exists and is still kind of uh, helping us uh, do coordinated work in Norway in this field. Also, we, we started to make new guidelines for flood protection and drainage, which was a severe, absolutely too weak before. So we are moving in the right direction thanks to this project. Uh, and next, the slide shows you that we didn't own, only do um, kind of a uh, background or, or, or sub work. We also do a lot of massive piloting of, of technology like radar surveillance, uh, deployment of sen sensors, uh, fiber optics, cameras. And we also did uh, quite an extensive work of mapping where the avalanches actually goes using radars and, uh, and with the help from the mapping authorities in Norway. So this, this kind of uh, takeaways from this project is that collaboration between different agencies and experts really pays off, even when you come to uh, to the piloting part of the technology. So, uh, if you move one more one more slide, uh, we have another project. It's called Abord. Um, that is uh, that is uh, all weather autonomous uh, real demonstrations. That's what it stands for. And it is a, a basic EU project that has nine, 29 partners and about $60 million in, uh, in turnover, uh, trying to uh, scale uh, up uh, the autonomous uh, kind of um, activities uh, in Europe. It is done by, by uh, or through four work uh, or use, use cases. Uh, with confined areas in, in the uppermost uh, left here, we have an autonomous uh, forklift uh, shifting uh, products from uh, from a production site to a storage yard. On the on the top right side, we have a, a long haul. It's not very long, but it's pretending to be long. A long haul vehicle uh, running autonomously on on the public roads between the production site and the logistic hub. And then at the, the bottom uh, left, we have an airport. Uh, luggage uh, carrier that takes the luggage from the from the conveyor belt in the trans in the terminal building to the plane autonomously, and uh, the, the last one is uh, to shift the long haul containers from uh, from from the long haul vehicles onto the ship and and uh, and opposite direction. All of these use cases are are, are are situated in different places where the weather is really shifting and uh, and you have a lot of ice and snow and wind and also uh, kind of salty and uh, a lot of spray in some of these cases so those four uh, cases are typical for what we need to kind of address in the real world as well so each of these use cases are then divided into four systems and that is the back uh, office of uh, of the system that is the upper left uh, blue uh, uh, square where you have the fleet management system, back office, and the logistic operations. What kind of uh, requirements do we need to have in place to, to support autom autonomous driving? And then uh, on, the, on, the, on the right side up, up there, you have the, the vehicle itself. What kind of sensors do it need? And everything that also was mentioned previously in, in, another, in, the, in, the, in the previous uh, presentation. And then you have the supporting infrastructure, where you have uh, traffic lights, traffic regulations, signs and uh, charging station for these uh, vehicles and last uh, bottom right is uh, is the where you shift uh, the 
when you shift the, 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 the goods from the, the vehicle to, uh, to some, somewhere else and back. And in this system, you also had a lot of gates that this, this um, uh, vehicle had to pass through, and also they are automated. So for each of these 16 combination of the use cases and the systems, we are looking at weather condition, traffic con condition, and events that occurs on, on the road surface. And then we try to um, kind of blend in the user requirements or the ODD, the operational uh, uh, design uh, domains for each of these uh, scenarios. And then we are testing out all of these, maybe uh, 200 different kind of ODDs that we create by, by combining these uh, e this system and these use cases. And then we see how far we can push uh, the ODDs to, uh, to make it 24 seven operation for all kinds of vehicles and roads. So what we learn here is, uh, is a lesson that we can use on the, on the public roads in severe weather conditions. That's the kind of ID, but we do this uh, also as a, as a push for autonomous vehicle to make that more uh, profitable by running them 24 seven, no matter what kind of weather, weather there is. So next, please. And we have another kind of project that is quite different, but also an EU project. This one is owned by ITS Norway. It's called Orchestra. And if you move one more uh, uh, slide ahead, it's all about multimodal transport orchestration. Uh, and I don't know how it is in, in the United States, but in Norway, we have uh, the rail traffic management center and you have that and you have it, the aviation traffic management road and, and maritime sector. All of these are kind of working very fine within their sector, but there is no kind of connection between them. So this, this project um, uh, kind of aims to make an ecosystem of, uh, of data sharing between the traffic centers in all modes of, of, of transport. And not only that, we also try to connect uh, fleet operators in each of these mode to the to the um, to the traffic management centers in, in a way that you can have a complete ecosystem of sharing between the fleet operators and uh, and the traffic management centers in, in all modes because then we can if a road closes today uh, in the southern part of Norway or maybe in um, in outside uh, outside mile and airports, which I will come back to, you will see that uh, the road is closed. Uh, can you shift to, to, to train, to air, to sea, to kind of mitigate the effect of the road closure? Today, that is uh, very hard to do, but this ecosystem of data sharing will ease that. So this is a kind of multimodal traffic management where you take the fleet management demands into to, um, yeah, to, 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 count, to count for that as well. So we kind of integrate and optimize all the operations by shifting between all the available uh, infrastructure that you have. This way you can also work out predictive model for how you can, how you can run this on, on the long term. So if you go one more ahead, and if you disregard the middle part of this, uh, of, of this slide uh, uh, in the beginning, the up, uppermost is, uh, is, the, is the kind of the, 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 the living lab we have in Italy. That is the Malpensa airport outside Milan, where we have the airport um, authorities working with the ATM of, uh, of the airport. If you, um, if you have a lot of access passenger coming in due to bad weather early on the day at the same time at the airport, then this system can uh, add uh, taxis, uh, buses, or trains to the airport, so kind of to mitigate the, um, the excess of passenger by kind of addressing the need a little bit in advance so they have time to shift around the, the, the vehicle resources and everything they have. And also opposite, if the bus service to the airport breaks down, you can have extra taxis uh, or a train uh, skipping in uh, or coming in and, and help. Same, same principle goes for the lower part of the screen when you have a, a kind of a vessel carrying a lot of uh, containers. If that vessel service is, uh, is down due to weather, then you have to use the, the road network and uh, the train network that is connected to the terminal. So this is the Norwegian kind of uh, living lab. It's called Heroya Industry Park. And we do the same kind of, uh, of um, exercise there 
to shift from uh, from ship to uh, rail and uh, and road service and then you also have this de demand balancing if you have like 40 or 60 or 100 uh, long haul vehicles coming into the road network at the same time you can ask the traffic management center to kind of help ease the problem if 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 they go in in, in small groups instead of all at the same time so you can kind of ask for permission to enter your, your road network, much the same way you do in rail and air. So this is the idea of, uh, of uh, orchestra, that is to optimize and integrate the modes of transport to ease the pain. So the last uh, uh, project that I want to, to kind of raise attention to is what we call the triangle project. It's all about predictable access to the infrastructure. And this time it's only uh, ferries and, uh, and mountain passes. So if you go to the next slide, this is about um, seven mountain passes in Southern Norway. Uh, and we have included two ferry crossings. It doesn't look like a triangle, more like a circle, but the name is anyway tri triangle. And the idea here is to, uh, to kind of uh, mitigate uh, the, the disadvantages if one of these uh, or more uh, of the mountain passes are closed, then how you can kind of uh, uh, deviate and, and use the ferry service instead. It is based on, uh, on uh, real-time sensors, uh, stat statistic uh, and, and better history, but also we have interviewed more than 1500 uh, users of, the, of this road network and the ferry services. So we know exactly what they want in order to have a safer or more predictable journey. So in this project, we use uh, the orchestra principle when we shift between the, um, uh, the road uh, and infrastructure, but also when we shift over to the ferries. So we kind of try to use the, the principles of, uh, of orchestra here. And also we use the concept developed in Avad to try to mitigate some of the, of the weather conditions. So, uh, this is, uh, as somebody mentioned earlier also, we, we have had to learn how to work across uh, the road administrations in, in Norway to do this. And that has been very hard to have a lot of the departments to work together in this, but also cross agencies. So we're also working with the, with the coastal administration on this one. So if you go to the next slide. So this is a little bit about the, the, the core of it, um, the, the, the users and the user associations and uh, kind of uh, industry or, um, or professional driver association have all been here to, uh, to kind of put forward their wishes. And they want a before departure um, kind of prediction of how the network will uh, look like in, 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 in a little bit into the future. And then before you enter a mountain, during a mountain passes and how you deal with roadworks and uh, how the ferry services are doing what is the real time schedule of that uh, ferry at the moment? Is it uh, delayed? What is the capacity of the ferry? If one or more of these uh, mountain passes breaks down, you need to know how many uh, kind of long haul vehicles can you have in, in the, can the ferry services swallow to, to mitigate the, the effect of the closing of the, of the mountains? And opposite, if the ferry services is out, uh, what is the capacity to, to run them over the, over the mountains? So these are the kind of the pain points that are mitigated uh, using, uh, using an app uh, at the moment, but it will be a kind of a systematic approach to this. So this leaves me with the summing up. So if you move, yeah. So realizing that there is absolutely not enough money in the world to, uh, to repair uh, the network and infrastructure in Norway to kind of uh, withstand all kinds of weather. We have to live with the danger and then we use a lot of different projects and approaches to uh, how to do that. And uh, these four uh, that I mentioned here is kind of contributing together to bring us uh, further uh, into the future and also will, will be a stepping stone for more projects to come. But what we have learned and I think is paramount is if you don't cooperate the cross agency and cross expert networks, we won't, we won't make it. Uh, that is as important as the technology that we can implement. So I think I'll leave it with this uh, on the next slide, uh, Luana. And thank you for helping me. Maybe Yanni will like to take over from here. I don't know. You can show the video, Luana. Thank you.
there was some quite nice sound uh, music, dramatic uh, music, but uh, you could probably imagine that while you were listening. Hi, my name is Jenny Simonson, and I also work for ITS Norway. Nice to meet you, and nice to, to be here. And, and this video is just a, a short uh, kind of like introduction to the weather conditions up north, and it was made by the county up north in Norway. Um, and we also would like to extend an invitation for a study tour because uh, when we talk about autonomous and connected vehicle and the future, we need to kind of uh, test it in real uh, weather and real harsh uh, environments. And uh, I'm not saying that you don't have that in, 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 in your great country, but, uh, but what we do is also have the cross border and the collaboration where we would like to kind of uh, extend an invitation to do a study tour uh, to see how we can also collaborate uh, further. Um, so that's kind of a from us in ITS Norway, and if you have questions, we're here. And if you happen to be in uh, ITS uh, World Congress in Los Angeles uh, um, during next week, we're here. We're there as well. Thank you. I will play the, the it one more time so everybody can hear the sound, and then I'll just say a few words before our break. All right, we all wanted to see all that snow again. <laughs> and it is a really good music. I really enjoyed it. Well, thank you so much, Trond and Jenny. This was great. I really enjoyed, uh, I'm sure all the participants enjoyed learning from you as well. It's very interesting to see uh, how you handle all the Norway weather conditions. And it's very interesting as well when I saw the multimodal approach that you have for that predictable road access. That's very interesting how you put all the pieces together and the autonomous vehicles, those four autonomous vehicles, very impressive. I, I really enjoyed uh, seeing your presentation. Thank you so much, uh, both of you. And as we move forward on our, our peer exchange, we'll take a 10 minute break. So we'll be back here about 12, 10 Eastern time, and then be ready for a Q&A session with our first speakers. And also we'll have a, a discussion about uh, some action items and some topics that were covered in the 2019 World Weather Management Peer Exchange that we had a few years ago. So 1210 Eastern Time, I'll see you all back. Thank you so much. There we go. So this is uh, just a few strategies based on the 2019 Road Weather, Man Road Weather Management Peer Exchange. Um, back in that peer exchange, four strategies were identified as the top areas with the highest payoff um, for the agencies. And we want to hear from you and see how, how is your agency uh, working on any of those strategies or if you have any other strategy that is um, the highest payoff for your agency. If you can put that on that, that number two question there, so we can um, have a better understand, understanding in, uh, of who's doing what and are those still the top areas that we should be paying attention to or there's something else that we need to start looking at. Um, those four areas that were identified in the previous, uh, previous road weather management peer exchange were number one, integrating mobile observations about road weather conditions for decision making. So that was uh, one of the the top areas that they 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 identified a few years ago, uh, and and think about what type of data you have been using. Uh, what is this data being used for? Uh, do you have any benefits? 
from those. And these are all things that we will keep discussing as we move forward in our breakout room discussions. And then as well, uh, things that you can share with the group about uh, data standards, or uh, do you have uh, mobile and fixed environmental sensor stations and things like that. Another uh, topic that was identified as one of the highest payoffs for agencies were variable speed limits uh, driven by road weather. So we already heard about it in one of the presentations today. And that's something that we would uh, like to hear from you. Is that something that you're still uh, prioritizing at your agency? And uh, what type of uh, road weather conditions usually are the, the main conditions that benefit from variable speed limit signs? And as well, do you have examples of benefits? And like I said, these are all things that we'll be discussing later today. Um, and uh, other thing that we want to learn from you today is what are some challenges if, you, if you've been trying to implement road weather management strategies, variable speed limits, or other uh, strategies as well? What are some challenges that your agency has been facing? And do you have any documentation that you use for system engineering criteria of uh, some, some strategies such as the variable speed limits. Um, that's all something that we can consider for later. And then also to get you thinking for what's coming later today uh, and based on the presentations we're having today, of course. Um, the number three strategy that was identified previously was active real-time uh, warning systems for road weather hazards. So again, what are the main weather conditions that trigger your agency uh, to use this, this type of strategy? And uh, do you have a list of basic elements that you can go through uh, when you implement your active real-time motorist warning systems? Also, what are the benefits for your agency? And lastly, what are the challenges that your agency is facing if you are implementing that, that type of strategy? And then most importantly, what we want to hear from you today is what are additional topics that we have not covered yet and you, you feel like for your agency they're important. Um, it could be related to some, uh, something that, some challenges that you're facing or uh, what are some additional issues that we have not covered yet. And it's important for us to move forward either with a, a more detailed road weather management peer exchange maybe Coming from this meeting today, we will identify those topics that we need to cover in more detail, maybe two days of um, uh, a conversation, followed by presentations as well, to try to understand something that you feel like it's a, a challenge or a need for, uh, for your agency. So I will end the poll. I think we have a few, I think we have a few answers. Thank you so much. And then back to our Q&A session. So I think most of us are back now. If you have any questions for our first speakers, please feel free to raise your hand and uh, we'll get the conversation going with them. All right, who is starting? And you can just unmute yourself as well if that's just easier. I don't know if I can. All right. Hello, Anna. This is Faisal. Can I ask a question? Absolutely. Okay. I think um, uh, one of the things that um, stuck with me was uh, this something new is uh, the predictive aspects of uh, traffic modeling. And uh, so I was kind of trying to see if uh, what we are doing here in the United States and what um, is happening in Europe or Norway, is it the same approach or, or there are different uh, approaches in terms of uh, predicting uh, the, the traffic conditions? Um, I was seeing that Tron was trying to bring multimodal aspects as well. So I, I just wanted to open up uh, for conversation. Uh, maybe understanding a little bit more about uh, the predictive aspects. I can give a short answer from uh, from my perspective. Um, I think it's quite similar to uh, to what uh, David or uh, Tony uh, 
said in, in their presentation, we are using uh, data uh, bases to store uh, events uh, and, uh, and conditions uh, that has happened over the years backwards. And um, looking for similarities in the weather that is coming up to see if uh, we need to do uh, to take action um, uh, and maybe close roads that we know will be vulnerable in, in those under those conditions and stuff like that. And uh, we used on uh, real time information from census and we used the database and we used the weather uh, services that uh, is available to us. And uh, also the experience of uh, users uh, that are in the mountains, uh, if that's the case, or along the coast, if that's the case. So there is a system of, uh, of trying to put together all the, the data sources to, to uh, turn it into a predictive service. It's very hard, but it's, I think uh, David and Tony kind of had the same ideas that we have in Norway. So it's, it looks similar to me. Yeah, just to, to follow on Tron, I think, you know, David kind of went over the, the IMRCP research that we're doing where we're, we're combining um, the weather forecasting and the, and the traffic data together. And, um, and, and there very much is a forecasting element to it, right? So you want to look at what are the historical sets of data, what happened when this type of storm happened, and so that you can sort of forecast that going forward. Um, but I will add that uh, one of the challenging things with that is sort of with the advent of some of the effects of climate change, those things are very different or behave different than we're expecting a lot more often now than, than we have in the past. So that's become a big challenge in terms of trying to, to forecast that. So, so I was going a little bit further on that question in the conversation. So both of you, both um, the presenters, uh, shared about automation and connectivity and automation. So I believe that this, this predictive uh, uh, aspect will be fed into an automated system. So how confident you are that uh, this will uh, be of, uh, of uh, some kind of, uh, is there some kind of a risk involved uh, with the automation and providing a predictive information? <laughs> yes, I think there is. <laughs> yeah, there's definitely risk. I, go ahead, Tron, I'll let you start and then I'll follow up if you want. Yeah, I think the, the reason why we started this award project is just that we, we need to, uh, to, to, to kind of find out everything we can or invest everything in, in investigate everything we can about how, how, we, how, um, an automated system, and then I mean not only the, the car, but also the, the the fleet management system and and the road uh, equipment and everything around it, how that will react to uh, different circumstances, and uh, that's why we it, we have to go in such detail in the award project that we kind of have uh, um, literally thousands of uh, user requirements that needs to be tested out. Uh, we we did we made those a kind of user requirements in the first three months of a three-year project. So we spend the rest of the project actually testing and piloting all of these nitty-gritty details to see how it fits. But so far, uh, it is still uncertainties uh, in built into that system. We cannot for sure say that how, how things will react under different circumstances. And I think it's a very valid point that Tony brought up with the, with the change of the weather, change of the climate, that how, how that will impact everything. Yeah, so for our, um, <clears throat> for our IMRCP project, we've been, um, we've been trying to improve our, our traffic modeling for several years now. Um, you know, like Tony mentioned, it pulls in historical information, but it also, you know, uses predictive information to you know, model what the anticipated traffic volumes and, and issues will be. Um, as also on our, you know, our automated vehicle and adverse weather, the, the technology is, at least with automated vehicles, is, is, has a hard enough time with just the weather implications. If you add into it other things like work zones and incidents and variable speed limits, et cetera, um, it gets, it gets very tricky, very fast. So, you know, the, the, 
the data framework that we're building out for managing disruptions to operations, um, the CV, AV uh, applications are, are one of the use cases that we're going to use that data for. But it, it's going to take time for the modeling to get to the point where um, not only are OEMs comfortable with feeding that data stream into their technology, but DOTs are also going to be a little bit apprehensive to uh, use that information to make uh, decisions. You know, it, it's no different than using forecast modeling to make decisions on preemptive closures for highways or um, changing policies, procedures, and laws based on forecasting. There's always an inherent risk when it comes to modeling of any of this information. Um, and, and that's just part of part of the the nature of the game is if you're modeling something, uh, it's it's never going to be 100% accurate. That's just the way it's going to be. Um, so folks are going to have to be uh, aware of that inherent risk when we're using these models and this data to feed into the systems, whether it be automated vehicles or um, you know whatever the use case may be. So. Uh, you know that, that that's a continual battle that um, has been going on. Another example of that is, you know, I would say the MDSS pooled fund study is a good example of something the technology has been uh, actively developed and improved upon for. And Dave can can correct me, but a long time, 15 plus years, I would say something around there. The pavement condition forecasting is very good, but it's not 100% accurate and never will be. Um, that's just the inherent risk of prediction. Um, so there's going to have to be a, some sort of conversation, a realistic conversation with policymakers and technology OEM, owner operators, all this, all these people to understand that uh, we might be able to get this to 99% or better accuracy, but there's always that chance that something's going to be wrong. And, are, you know, are we, are we okay with that risk? Are we okay with that risk appetite? In whatever the use case may be. Thank you. So David, I was going uh, where I was going with because I think one of the objectives of this uh, peer exchange is to see if we can identify some research topics for the future. Uh, so I was kind of uh, thinking that um, you know that like there is uh, some kind of a, if there is a some kind of a relationship developed between the risk of the data and the operation. Um, I don't know, I'm just uh, throwing it out there for, for you guys. Um, but but uh, I'm coming from Phoenix, um, you know, I was in Phoenix and I remember, I mean, there are, of course you have these automated vehicles operating there and um, it's fascinating to see them. But but when it used to rain a little bit in Phoenix, they, they would have stopped the operation. So, so definitely there is a need for some kind of a data to feed them that can, you know, give them more confidence. One of the things that I think is important and um, what we built our weather data environment around is the, the quality control and quality assurance. There's 14 or 15 checks and balances on, you know, the, the data that's coming into the environment, uh, checking the validity and accuracy of that data to what, whether it should be flagged as something that should be used or not. That really needs to be done across all data sets, whether it be work zone parameters, whether it be incident parameters. We don't even have a specification for traffic incident events right now. Um, so we're, I, I, would, I would say we're still fairly um, in, in our infancy with data and maturity on some of these uh, operational data sets that we really need. Um, connected and automated vehicles are gonna need to know where, where incidents are. They're gonna to need to know all the parameters of a work zone. And those inputs that are coming into our, any sort of data framework need to be standardized. And we're working on that on the work zone and road weather. The road weather piece is very mature. Work zone stuff is, is, is definitely there. Specifications and standards have been created, but there's other stuff that um, you know we're, we're still needing to improve upon before we can really um, I would say bundle an operational data set to feed into an AV, for example. So um, there, there's still a lot of research and development that needs to, realistically needs to take place for operational data right now. All right, thank you so much. Do we have any other questions for our speakers today? 
I don't see anything. So with that, let me share our results of our poll real quick. So basically, we have more than 50% of agencies that are still using at least three of those uh, strategies that were identified as the previous uh, top four strategies on road weather management in the in the peer exchange in 2019. And then uh, uh, one agency mentioned that route optimization is also a big um, strategy with one of the highest payoff for the agency. So that's what we ha had from those. And with that, I will uh, go ahead and move on to our next speaker. Hey, actually, uh, oh. Luana, I wanted to ask a question, I think of our Federal Highway Partners real quick. Okay, um, there you go. I, I know that you know a lot of the data and information you you mentioned in a couple of the programs is related to weather service data. I guess more about more around rain and snow events. Is there any current work or research connecting you know stormwater flow related to flooding and highway accessibility and things like that? You know, in terms of being able to drain be able to drain the highway if you end up with you know higher level you know moderate medium to moderate level flooding and things like that. Yeah, I'm going to pass that to Tony. Like I mentioned on our IMRCP um, slides, we do have we we did just introduce inundation modeling, mm -hmm. um, and so we've been using uh, the National Water Center models and mm -hmm. um, some of that information. So I'd say we're just starting to broach that topic. Okay. Tony has a resiliency project that he's going to be kicking off here soon that I think will really focus in on some of that uh, flood mitigation data. That you're mm -hmm. that you're talking about there, Doug. Um, yeah. I don't know if you want to. Uh, and and some of it I'm looking at. Up on. Yeah, and some of it I'm thinking of of not like major flooding events, but like minor flooding events where you have a heavy storm, you have a creek or, or small river rise enough where there are, there's localized flooding flooding that affects traffic flow, but that you'll know over X hours that it'll drain out as long as there's no storm drains affected and things like that. So that's a, that's what I'm thinking of just based on some some experience I've, I've, I've seen recently. It, yeah, so it's a good question, Doug. And, and so with respect to the data going into the weather data environment, most of it is coming from ESS type stations, which most of them do not have flood gauges. They have precip sensors and precip data, but not really, it's more specific to the road weather. But that being said, we have started engaging a little more with the, the river groups in the National Weather Service, because historically we didn't talk to those groups because we were just talking about what's the local data going to be mm -hmm. instead of understanding the bigger um, the bigger road river side, river impact right. side. So we started engaging them. Also, the Corps of Engineers is a key set yeah. of data. But the, the what we're going to work on in, in the next couple of years in the resiliency project is developing a guide that you, that the agencies can use to assess that risk you're talking about. So now you can go to a bridge and say, or as a, for example, a bridge and say, hey, what's the risk now of this being a problem? And what are the mitigation things we need to understand? Like you just mentioned, do we need to clean culverts here? What, what, mm -hmm. what are those strategies we deploy when we get a forecast that says this bridge is now at risk? What are those yeah. things? So that's the next step. And yes, clearly it, there are more events like that that are an issue. So we're yeah. looking to target that. Yeah, I'm also looking at like, you know, storm water, water flow and storm drains and things like that, because that's, you know, if you can't get the water into the drain, that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> right. But I mean, there's other elements to this too, you know, the heavy rain creating that issue, especially if you don't have the right drainage, but right. you know, things that issues are dealing with Alaska where they had a bridge wiped out by rapid, you know, glacier melt. And right. it's like, whoa, right. you've got to think about things like that and mm -hmm. try to forecast that and look at, is this bridge now where it wasn't before at a higher risk? And then what right. would you do to mitigate that, that melt risk? So, yeah. So yeah, there's a lot of issues we're hoping to kind of start tackling with okay. that. Yeah, I see Dave's got uh, Dave Huff's got his hand up. Uh, Dave, um, you got something to add here? Yeah, Doug. In in response to your question, I just wanted to mention the pool fund study that is going on, kind of in the middle of the country. It's from Montana. Um, we're hoping to get Wyoming in, but the Dakotas, hoping to get Nebraska in, Minnesota, Iowa, Missouri. Wisconsin, Illinois, and Michigan. And we're looking at the trends and peak flows um, from that entire drainage area because the trends are changing. 
some parts are becoming drier, some parts are becoming wetter. Mm -hmm. And so this is a little bit more aimed on the design side of things so that structures are sized appropriately, but it, mm -hmm. it will um, have good information about the trends in peak flows and streams. Okay. Thanks, Dave. Okay, if nobody had anything else, Lamana, I'll turn it back to you. <laughs> Yeah, I don't see any other hands up, so we'll move on. And that's good timing for Dave. So he already um, start mentioning a few things that he's been working on. Uh, we have our third presenter, Dave Huff from South Dakota DOT. He is going to talk a little bit not only about South Dakota initiatives, but also uh, some research that's been doing that's been done on this topic. So with that, I'll just hand it over to Dave. Luana says I can't share my screen while somebody else is. He should be able to do it now. Yes. Can you see that? Yes, I can see it. Very good. Well, thank you. Um, this presentation is um, a little less researchy and more implementation oriented compared to um, Federal Highway Administration's presentation and the, the real interesting presentation from Norway. It's describing some of the things that we're doing here in South Dakota. Maybe preface this by saying South Dakota is a, a plain state. It's northern tier. We get a lot of winter weather. Um, it's also a very rural state. And so everything that you see here will kind of be couched in that um, type of environment. I want to talk uh, very briefly about two or three topics. The first three on the list, equipment improvements, route optimization, level of service, and spend a little more time on the last topics, which are travel information maintenance decision support and variable speed limits. Uh, the two equipment improvements that I'll highlight here is more extensive use of tow plows. We, we did not invent the tow plows, but we've been um, adopting them quite a bit, especially for multi-lane facilities. We've also even used some in the, in the Black Hills area, which is a more curvy uh, type of road environment. Um, but that has, um, really, really helped us. Um, the other innovation that we've tried is the lighting on snow plows. And we got legislation last year to be able to put blue lights on trucks in addition to the yellow and, um, and the strobe lights. And you see some photos here showing how that shows up. <clears throat> we've had good response from vehicle operators, from the maintenance vehicle operators, uh, feeling that they are more visible and also good feedback from the public saying that they're able to uh, detect the plows more quickly. We're engaged in a route optimization um, project right now. This is not adaptive route optimization. It's more um, route optimization from for our baseline routing. And um, looking at the preliminary results, we're just starting to get those, but it's looking like we might be able to save between 15 and 20% of the miles travel to, to cover the routes. Um, this is work that's going to be extending through the fall until the end of this year, but um, uh, somebody somebody earlier mentioned that the, there are uh, acceptance uh, issues whenever you change things. We're expecting that this will uh, have some of those. We're having meetings with some of our maintenance units this week, showing them the early results, sort of doing reality checks on uh, the routing that's being proposed, but um, seeing some opportunity for efficiency. And then another thing that's a, of interest to us, and I'm sure to other DOTs, is how do you define level of service? We've typically defined it by sort of input measures. We, we want to cover the road every two hours for our priority routes and every four hours for our non-priority routes. But those are more input measures rather than what does the, uh, what is the output, what is the output measure? What is the public experience when they drive on the road? 
one of the things we've looked at is using uh, probe data to tell us what the speeds are on the on the roads and um, make the association that the travel speed um, correlates with the road condition. Um, this chart shows uh, some analysis and it was kind of a lo logic analysis, but um, the when when the speeds are between zero and 76 percent of the free flow speed the average speed is then we have a pretty good probability that the road has snow on it and uh, we're not using that to decide whether we should go treat the road but it would tell us that the road has been in has been in a snowy condition between 76 percent and 87 percent we really don't know it could be either or and uh, above 80% of the free flow speed, we're seeing that the probability is very good that the, uh, that the roads are clear. So we're looking at this as a possible way to transition to a more performance-based level of service. And I know that other states in our region are uh, trying similar things and um, trying to find a way that's meaningful uh, to define and measure level of service. I'll transition here to, um, let me move this out of the way, to traveler information. Um, we do have a, a 511 website. We have iOS, Android apps. We have text and email notifications, Twitter feed. We still maintain the 511 phone service. And something we've added recently is putting kiosks in our rest areas and our commercial vehicle ports of entry. The screen on the lower left is um, just the screen that's uh, for our website. And you can see that it depicts road conditions by shading the roads different colors. Um, the, the clouds are environmental sensor stations that have weather observations in them. Some of them you see have numbers, which would, in this case, would be temperature. Others have little numbers saying there's actually two environmental sensor stations there. And if you zoom in, they'll separate. Um, let's see here. Um, part of the information that we provide is from environmental sensor stations. We have 132 of these located statewide. Um, all of them have high resolution infrared illuminated uh, and tilt zoom cameras. So we get images day and night, and then they have weather sensors. Um, we have not used pavement surface sensors much. And the reason we went away from that is it seemed like every time we put a sensor in, we would overlay the road the next year. And uh, we do have non-contact sensors at one location, but um, we're primarily um, observing the atmospheric conditions at these sites and, of course, the camera images. Um, this shows one of the kiosk displays. Um, the kiosk displays scroll through different screens. This particular screen shows cameras along I-90, um, shows where the traveler is, and so they get an idea of what the conditions are along the entire route that they're going to be traveling. Um, this, there are several screens. I'm just showing a couple. This one is wind speeds, which is of particular interest to commercial vehicle operators. And this wasn't a particularly windy day, except down in Nebraska. It was the wind speeds were in the 30s um, and uh, up to 40 miles an hour. We have high wind speeds a lot. And so having 60, 70 mile an hour straight winds is not that unusual. And so this is really important to commercial carriers. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the uh, maintenance decision support system, and Dave Johnson mentioned this. This has been a pool fund study for a very long time. <laughs> um, it's actually been a series of pool fund studies, but um, started in 2002. Uh, the states were Indiana, Minnesota, and the Dakotas. Uh, we have been the lead state throughout the study. Uh, we have state DOTs, and we have a couple of local agencies that are kind of friends to the pool fund study. Um, each state contributes uh, some funding to help fund the development of the MDSS and 
um, scientific studies related to the basis of MDSS. Um, DTN is the contractor for the pool fund study. All of the states on the map have participated in the study at one time or another. The ones that are shaded uh, more dark blue are the current participants in the in the study. And uh, the premise of MDSS is that if you know the characteristics of your road and you know the current uh, conditions on the road and you know what the predicted weather is and you understand how snow and ice and chemicals behave and if you know what resources you have to work with then the MDSS can recommend the treatment type and application rate and, and an optimal timing for that application and predict the road conditions, whether you treat or whether you don't treat. And so the analysis of what happens if you do treat or what happens if you treat with option A, B, C, or D is really the analysis that's going on with MDSS. And the cartoon in here uh, illustrates the factors that are considered in MDSS. So the red arrows represent heat flows and they can go up or down into the atmosphere or from the atmosphere down into the pavement or from the subgrade up to the pavement or the other way, depending on what time of year you are. There's even a little bit of trap of heat uh, generated from traffic. The blue arrows are material and the material could be precipitation, it could be salt, it could be um, uh, grit. Uh, the material is moved by the plow. It's also distributed by traffic and it runs off the road because of the crown of the road or the grade. And all of these things are considered in the in the analysis of, of MDSS. It's a, a numerical simulation of what's going on on the roadway. And this illustrates um, the simulation versus the, the roadway condition. This is a case on Interstate 29. It's a photo uh, in North Dakota. The blue band illustrates what MDSS was predicting to be the distribution of material on the road. Um, the photograph, of course, is illustrating what the distribution, the actual distribution of material was on the road. And also showing here the percent ice and the temperature of the roads. This was a fairly warm event and a, a slushy, slushy snow. Um, of course, the better that we can predict the road condition um, and the better we can predict the behavior of the treatments, the, the more meaningful the recommendations are. Um, the MDSS provides a, a user interface that has uh, rich information about the road conditions and the weather conditions that are going on. Um, there are alert dashboards and um, it's a very rich user interface. Uh, part of the user interface is uh, graphs. There are, this can also be represented in chart, a tabular form, showing all, all kinds of measurements, wind speed and direction, probability of percentages of, of precipitation, um, precipitation accumulations, uh, dew points, you name it. Um, and by examining this, you can get a really good picture <laughs> excuse me, of what's going to happen um, going forward. Um, this illustrates some time prior to the present and also up to 48 hours future from the present. There is uh, onboard instrumentation on snowplows that help to report what the what treatments are being done. You see the the user display in the left photo. There's a road temperature sensor, an infrared sensor looking at the road, ambient air temperature sensor. And on, on the snowplow, you'll see a mercury, hard mercury switch, which tells us whether the plow is up or down. And all of the plows on our trucks are equipped with the sensors. Sometimes there are as many as three, three blades on a plow. And then of course we have GPS and cellular communication. The right image is more the user interface inside the inside the truck. This happens to be focused in a in an area which isn't South Dakota, but you'll see the type of information, what the truck is doing, and then there's also a screen that recommends what treatment should be applied based on the MDSS analysis. And this goes directly into the operator's truck. Um, we don't. Um, 
in South Dakota have a, a heavily dispatch system. It's a more of a system where each truck operator is making decisions about what to do on the roadway informed by the MDSS. One of the decisions we had to make is whether we would move from kind of a trial deployment of MDSS where we had about 30% of our roadways in MDSS or go to a statewide uh, adoption or move away from MDSS altogether. And um, we, we did a study, it was done by Louisiana State um, University, but uh, looking at the benefits and costs of deployment um, statewide, if we consider just the direct costs, the, the, the agency benefits and the agency costs, uh, the benefit cost ratio was just a little bit better than one to one. If we considered the safety and, uh, and road use costs in addition to direct or benefits and in addition to direct benefits, then the benefit cost ratio raised to over three to one. And so on the basis of this research, we decided to expand MDSS to all of our state highways and to expand the mobile data collection to all, our entire snowplow fleet. And uh, we're incremental, incrementally adding the onboard instrumentation to our trucks. We're about two thirds of the way to having all of our trucks instrumented um, and would expect to complete by the end of next year. <clears throat> Last topic I want to talk about is variable speed limits and South Dakota has not done these before. So this is new work for us. Um, the first place we're going to deploy this is on Interstate 90. Um, on a section from Sturgis to Tilford. Sturgis, of course, is the location of the motorcycle rally. Um, and um, it's on the north edge of the Black Hills. Uh, it experiences a, a lot of bad winter weather, but it also has some unique um, traffic characteristics, including the Sturgis rally. Um, the, the peak attendance of that was three quarters of a million bikers in 2015. And uh, this year we had a, a, between five and 600,000. So for a couple of weeks in the, in the summer, it's a very different traffic environment. Um, so we're trying to address weather challenges. Uh, the, middle, uh, the middle picture here is actually a, a South Dakota event where the trucks turned around and, and backwards on, on the interstate uh, in, a, in a winter event. Um, so, we are installing variable speed limits on this section of road. We have another section on Interstate 29 in the east part of the state that is sort of happening in parallel. It'll be done right after this one, but it will be a regulatory speed limit. It won't be advisory. It took special legislation to enable us to do this. Uh, prior to this, the Transportation Commission had to meet to change the speed limit, which of course, completely impractical for variable speed limits. We're going to be measuring surface condition on the road. We're going to be measuring um, visibility and uh, also uh, precipitation and um, other weather conditions, temperatures and so forth. Um, and beyond that, the traffic speed and volume, because one of the indicators that a variable speed limit is warranted is that the traffic speeds begin to drop and the traffic speeds disperse. You have some people that are still driving 75 miles an hour and some people that are driving 30 miles an hour, which of course is uh, a danger in itself. All of our um, speed limit signs, static speed limit signs will be replaced by electronic uh, speed limit signs. We're hoping to reduce winter crashes and fatalities by at least half. And we're basing this on largely on Wyoming's experience who has used variable speed limits for more than a decade very successfully. And so we're really um, in, in some large part imitating the, the good work that Wyoming has done. One of the things we were interested in is whether the public would be receptive to variable speed limits. And so we first asked this question in 2018, would you temporarily, would you favor temporarily lower, lowering speed limits to match road conditions? And two thirds of the respondents to our uh, uh, customer satisfaction survey, this is something we do every, every two or three years, um, said yes, they would favor that. About a quarter, 23% said they would not, and their 10% weren't sure uh, about it. We repeated this question again in 20, 
21. And the results were essentially the same. The, the yeses went up a little bit. Uh, the noes went down a little bit. Um, the don't knows reduced. Um, but uh, essentially, it was the same very strong level of support for, for doing this on, among the public. And of course, this is something they have not experienced in South Dakota before. So it's um, asking, would you not, do you like it now that we have it? We'll of course be monitoring this after we do put it in. And I wanted to show you this section. This is the section of roadway from Sturgis to Tilford. Sturgis is on the upper left. It's a city of about 7,000 people. Interstate 90 goes through, comes down, and there's a very small town on the on the lower right, which is which is called Tilford. <clears throat> but we are putting variable speed limits everywhere in this uh, photograph or or cartoon depiction. Um, everywhere there's a 45, it means that there's variable speed limits. The normal speed limit is 75. So as you leave the section, it'll go back to 75. And likewise, down the other end, on the east end of the project, it'll go back to 75 going eastward. But in addition to the variable speed limits, we're putting in three environmental sensor stations. These are the towers. Um, we're putting in traffic detection to get the traffic speeds and dispersion of traffic. Um, between every set of, of exits and between every interchange on the uh, on the roadway. We have two dynamic message signs in this roadway now. We're adding two more <clears throat> to give better instructions to uh, to travelers. The corridor will have full camera surveillance. Not that there are a, a huge number of cameras, but um, by strategically placing the cameras, we'll be able to see every every portion of the corridor um, by zooming zooming to them. Um, another thing that is new for us, we've had road closure gates um, at Sturgis where these uh, red, red signs are, both Sturgis exits, um, but they're manual and you have to go out and crank them down. And these will be automated so they can be controlled from uh, the traffic management system. Uh, another thing which is more related to the Sturgis Rally is queue detection on the exit ramps um, at three interchanges. And the last thing that I have noted here is we are replacing our commercial vehicle uh, port of entry uh, with with brand, actually a new physical port of entry and also um, a replacement of the electronic screening system. <clears throat> the electronic screening system is going to be uh, have the addition of tire anomaly checking. This is an in-pavement set of sensors that measures the tire pressure of um, the tr trucks crossing it and warns when a truck has a underinflated or uninflated tire and then thermal brake checking on the inbound ramp to the port of entry to look for um, inoperable or defective brakes. So this this is probably one of the, while well, it is the most intensive um, deployment of intelligent transportation devices in South Dakota. This is going to be installed um, next summer. The plans are just nearing completion right now. So uh, <clears throat> I this is my contact information. It's kind of a quick overview, but so much of what we do in ITS here is related to uh, road weather management and um, just wanted to show some examples of, of a fairly small rural state um, applying some of these techniques uh, on, on in operation on highways. And uh, Luan, I'd be happy to take any questions if there are some. Thank you. Thank you so much. Another great presentation. As we mentioned before, you feel free to Raise your hand if you have a question or uh, you can tap, uh, just type it on the chat pod and then I'll be glad to ask that for you. Um, very interesting presentation. Thank you, Dave. Uh, I really, uh, really appreciate it seeing especially that almost 70% seven, of people are okay with the reduction in, in speed limits temporarily due to road weather. So we definitely need to prioritize road safety. I really appreciate seeing that. We have Aaron's uh, hand is up. So Aaron. Uh, feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, thank you. Um, question uh, about the VSL 
the variable speed limits, um, will those be placed automatically based on your ATMS and, and information from environmental sensor stations or speed data, or will they have to go through an operator? So you have some level of control where the operator in a in an operation center will make that determination to actually place the variable speed. Um, very good question. At this point, uh, the, the enabling legislation that we got requires that a human bless the the speed limits. So we want to develop algorithms that um, recommend the speed limit. And we realize that we have learning to do there. So it's maybe a good thing we're not just automating them at the at the beginning. We we recognize that we're going to be learning a lot, maybe the first couple of years that we do this. But uh, so it will require a human approval. Thank you. I'll go first to this uh, question on the chat pod and then uh, Doug, I'll hand it to okay. you. So Kevin uh, asked, does your level service change based on storm severity, traffic, et cetera, or are these variables already based in your methodology? Great presentation. Thank you for sharing. <clears throat> the level of service that we've historically used has been based on the input. Uh, how often are we going to um, uh, treat the road. There's also another set of measures, which are how long will it be until we achieve recovery, 80% recovery of the road, 80% of the surface. And those are defined in hours after the storm. And kind of illustrates the, um, the deficiency of these kinds of measures, because when you have a small storm, it's very easy to achieve those recovery times. Um, we always do. Even in a moderate storm, we always do. In a exceptional storm where you've got interstate closures for for two days, we don't. And so our our measures do not really account for the variability in in storm severity. And I think that's a challenge for for everyone. How do you how do you do that? Except to acknowledge that there are times that you don't achieve your your targets. Um, what we are trying to do, though, is try to trying to define measures that relate better to customers' expectations of of um, of what kind of service they they need or expect during winter events, and we're okay. we're not there yet. Thank you, Doug. You're next, and then I'll I'll ask another question. Yeah, Thank I was going to, and I actually Mike McPherson put a uh, an item in the chat pod, which is actually kind of where I was going. Um, First question, Dave, are the uh, CONOPS and system engineering documents available for other public agencies to refer to? Almost. Okay. <laughs> We've been well, working. When you, you get to that point, uh, we'll, we'd be happy to share them through the center <laughs> for, yeah. for other agencies. Yeah, I mean, there is a lesson here, Doug. We've been working with a consultant, and the mm -hmm. consultant was very reluctant to use the, the the right methodology so they, they made a very rough concept of operations went to design and we have paid a dreadful price for that and so we're, we're working backwards now mm. to revise the concept of operations with with all the changes that we've made mm. and so i a warning don't don't ever do it that way <laughs> Maybe maybe there's a little lesson learned uh, uh, monologue you could give us uh, after after you get through that exercise. I think we all we would all benefit from it. Um, but the the actual question I had was actually it's related to the presentation I saw previously. I think Mike McPherson from VDOT gave that on the I-77 stuff they're doing down in uh, Southern Virginia. Um, Mike had asked a question in the chat pod about using the VSL uh, application for high wind events. Uh, my question was kind of piling on to that is I know the Virginia uh, application actually does kind of a a build down in speed so the speeds progressively drop up to where the visibility obstruction the typically it's fog down there occurs so that people are progressively slowing so is there a kind of even with the operator input is there kind of a uh, you know decision or um, application system that allows for that level of detail and versus the spacing of the signs yeah um 
the answer is yes, but I'll, I'll say it say with a little bit of caveat. This this section on I-90 is about 14 miles long. Okay. And so you don't have a huge amount of, of transition mm -hmm. area. Now, as we expand from this into the adjacent sections further east and further west, then that becomes much uh, a much more valuable technique. On a short section, you're a little bit limited as to how many step downs you can do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. And then, then Mike was asking about, um, are you going to use this for high wind events? Yeah, the VSLs are predominantly for winter events, but we we have a large trucks, um, doubles, uh, full double trailers. Uh, we have long combination vehicles on this route, and uh, there is high wind here, so we would use, um, if not variable speed limit, certainly the DMS is to warn warn truckers about the okay. about the winds. Whether whether slowing the speed down is the right thing to do, we're not sure. Okay. Thanks, Dick. This is Mike. Actually, I couldn't think, find the uh, raise hand option here. Oh, but, okay. Uh, Sorry about uh, that for, for taking over your question. Oh, no, 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 no. That That's that's perfectly okay. Uh, yeah, uh, just a couple things. One, here in Virginia, we do do the step down that you mentioned. Uh, we, we try to step them down uh, no more than 15 miles an hour per uh, per sign, and we have our signs that spaced about every every mile. Uh, and what we have found is that for the most part, people will not slow down until they see our, the actual fog. And once they see the fog, then they realize, oh, these guys are actually serious, and then they'll slow down. Uh, but overall, our system has been very effective. I think uh, what we've seen is a reduction of crashes by about 78% uh, during these heavy fog events. So it's been very, uh, very effective. Uh, but we are actually looking at look, using this system uh, for uh, high wind events. And uh, I think Dave just mentioned, you know, not sure if that's going to work. And I'm, I'm not sure it's going to work either. I was hoping other people would have some uh, information as far as uh, what they're doing with high winds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if, if, Mike, uh, you know, when, when, the, when the winds are 50, 60, 70 miles an hour, the best thing is to stop. Yeah. <laughs> Not to, you know, and, and even a 45 mile an hour speed limit, if it's crosswind, isn't going to change things that much. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's kind of the conclusions that we have come up with, but my district administrator is wanting to use the VSLs anyway. So <laughs> I'm trying yeah. to figure out how I can do that. Yeah. And I wouldn't say it's wrong. I think we just need to learn. Yeah. Okay. And it might be something where there's a threshold for under a certain wind level, about about you know, below a certain number you don't don't use it. Some middle number you, with wind speed you do use it, and then above that you know you close it to the to the vehicles or something. All right. Sounds good. Thanks. Luana, one comment I wanted to maybe add on the MDSS, it relates to the uh, the emphasis areas that you were asking us to ballot about, but the MDSS is expanding into uh, incorporating mobile devices, uh, mobile device observations. And then um, another thing which relates to something that Mike just said is the credibility of the system. So, you know, motors, motors won't slow down until they, they actually see frog, fog. Um, same way with maintenance operators, they really want the information to be reliable, and and when it isn't, it, it erodes the credibility. So another big emphasis of our MDSS uh, research is the assessment of the recommendations and kind of a trace back. Are we predicting the road conditions correctly? Are we predicting the weather conditions correctly? Is that whole chain mm -hmm. of progression behaving uh, well and and identifying weak areas that might need to be um, shored up? So. Um, I think the work here, to me, validates your <laughs> your emphasis areas. Uh, mm -hmm. Just certainly, certainly fits. Hey, hey Luana, I was going to ask Dave kind of another follow up question. Um, Dave, since you and I had a week together last week in uh, in Arizona <laughs> with the uh, Ashto Committee on Transportation System Operations, I know you gave a, uh, a brief presentation from the Road Weather Management Working Group. And it's kind of a lead into the breakout rooms and kind of some of the questions we might do, um, kind of on the look ahead from you know the the questions that um, Lawana 
mentioned from three years ago in terms of you know the, the kind of the the next topics you know uh if i recall there was a slide that you had on kind of what the next topics the the working group was going to be looking at uh in kind of the near term do you happen to recall those off the off the top of your head sorry to put you on the spot for that I think you have me confused with Steve Cook. Oh, okay. Maybe Steve was talking about all that. Okay. <laughs> I, I, was, I keep I forgetting was, which I keep forgetting which person was presenting on which pieces. Yeah, so, I, I'm okay. sorry. I, I have to think a little bit to remember what what okay. they said. Sorry about that. I uh, Stephen Rick. Stephen Rick. Nelson. Oh, okay. That's right. I keep forgetting which person is in which group. Um, I'll see if I can dig out the slides before we can get to the the end of the next session just to cover those. All right. Well, thank you so much. And then I think this, uh, I, I see a few other comments in the chat box. So basically, uh, Arizona and um, Jeff Williams already mentioned that his agency uses VSL. So we'll save those for our discussion and the breakout rooms is exactly what we try to do next. So uh, we can take a, a quick break. Let's all be back here about one Okay, let's take another 10 minute break, 115, uh, 125 uh, Eastern time. And then that will give us just a few minutes for discussion after. So don't be intimidated. We just want to hear from you. We just want to make sure that we understand what the next steps need to be, research needs, or any issues that your agency is facing on world weather management. So uh, we'll all be back here at 125 uh, Eastern. And we'll break you up in two uh, rooms mm -hmm. and then we'll get some conversation going. Thank you so much for being here until now and I hope to see you all soon. Well, thank you so much for your input. We really appreciate all your thoughts, sharing with us how we can keep working on road weather management strategies. Mm -hmm. We will share um, a summary of our breakout rooms just very quickly and then we'll wrap up for the day. Um, Doug, if you can start with a few. Sure. sure, I will start with a few things here. I'm just going to touch on a couple of high level things. First of all, we're kind of talking about the maintenance decision support systems and, you know, sharing in, you know, how different agencies after today's presentation do what they do. Uh, Michigan DOT shared that they find that it's really helpful with newer staff uh, or late, you know, overnight shifts where you have new folks who are trying to figure out application rates you know, different things like that. Uh, also interested in, they used to use a lot of um, environmental sensor stations and they have cameras on those. And there's, you know, an interest in having more cameras to get more detailed coverage, um, which is also one of their kind of wish list items uh, down, at, down at the end in terms of things that they need. Um, <clears throat> the other question was kind of, where does the money come from for the support for, um, Containing MDSS systems. Uh, some states have it as part of their regular operating. That's what South Dakota does. Others use their ITS maintenance uh, fund, which is a separate budget than just general operations and maintenance. Uh, there was some discussion about timing of contracts so that they don't end uh, in the winter time and you know the transition between vendors because it's an open bid uh, process. Um, and then you know, some folks were looking on, you know, whether or not the MDSS is kind of a learning type tool, you know, in terms of an AI, but typically they aren't, um, but they can, you know, as the process of reviewing different events, they can be updated um, on the back end. Um, so, you know, one thing was interesting, Tron mentioned was that they have had a mountain pass where they basically brought in all sorts of different vendors, 30 plus vendors to install their applications and have kind of a kind of festival of winter maintenance uh, the, uh, ITS devices. And uh, they tested those out kind of in a, a test road environment. And then they could, you know, have the different vendors were shortlisted from that to look at uh, their use on other mountain passes within within Norway. Um, so the two questions at the end on um, research activities or standards and guidelines, one is um, because different states use different terminology, kind of a winter road weather dictionary, a weather, winter road management dictionary, so that the terms are kind of uh, crossing over. Um, a little bit of information on how to use the different uh, budgets within states for 
maintenance level type activities as opposed to deployments. Um, and then information on what the regulations or regulatory legislative process to establish variable speed limits, kind of an information exchange between different states um, and how to uh, collect data from vehicles for variable speed limits uh, in terms of you know, can we tra can you transmit from connected vehicles, wheel slip, ABS applications, things like that. Last question was a very short round robin of what do you need uh, or wish list. Uh, one is how to get data out of the vehicles to be able to inform MDSS systems uh, or other systems. Staffing, which is, because I, I told people you couldn't save money. Uh, so staffing and also getting more data uh, we're kind of filling out the space where there isn't data, uh, either through crowdsourcing or fixed site uh, environmental stations. So that's a very, very brief summary uh, of what we discussed. Does anybody in our group want to add anything that I might have missed? Hearing nothing back to you, Luana. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, our group, uh, just very quickly to, to talk a little bit about what we discussed. So we had a group that is not mostly winter weather, uh, the, the predominant characteristics. They Some of them do have some winter weather, but they also have uh, several conditions such as flat, uh, flash flood, dust, fog, other things that are not necessarily just related to winter. We had participants from Georgia, Alabama, uh, Virginia, Maryland, all those, all those states. And um, one of the things that we discussed um, is moving forward, what are some things that we, we need to pay attention to, some research needs, um, how do they need help with. And uh, one of the things that we talked about was uh, understanding performance measures. So a few states collect um, speeds, uh, crash overall crashes, or rear end crash reduction. Um, road surface friction, uh, but a, a few states are still uh, have limitations to either collect data that could help them make better road weather management and for, um, better informed decisions. So uh, one thing that we need to look is what, what is that data? What are those performance measures and uh, how can we uh, collect them in a way that they can be ap uh, applied to road weather management? And then I think the biggest takeaway from this group was uh, most of them are very reactive. So the, the decisions are mostly made based on forecasts or you know, coordination with other agencies and things like that, but it's still um, not proactive. So there is a, a need to try to develop those uh, predictive traffic control model and also try to address uh, some elements. For example, there are a limitation. One of the examples mentioned was uh, communication to remote areas. So how can you be proactive if you don't even know if your flashers are actually working the way that they should? So one of the things that, that, that needs to be addressed as well is on, on, on those limitations to proactive uh, road weather management, how can we make sure that we um, improve that and uh, um other than that i think that's that's all what we had for our group so we'll go ahead and wrap up our event today let me go back to i was trying to yeah i can't do it today what i'll do after i will send you um a few questions a few poll questions mostly asking let me share this with you oops Okay. There you go. So uh, one more time, this was the first agile format of a peer exchange for the Center of Excellence. And so you receive in your email a post event survey. So just a few questions that we'd like to ask you. Um, this was a three hour event. And so we're still trying to figure out what the best format for that is. So it's informative to all of you. And so we can also learn from you uh, what, how we can, we can help with next steps. So uh, we'll send over just a few questions on what do you think of this format? Do you think it was informative? Do you think it was too short? Uh, would you rather uh, sign up for, for the longer formats that are two or three days? Do you think it's uh, more beneficial for your agency if you have to commit the time 
And also, we really would like to see how we can improve those peer exchanges moving forward. And uh, that's, that's why we're here. We're just trying to make sure we can uh, improve operations and give you the best tools possible. So this is all I had for today. Thank you so much. One more time, I'll hand it over for Faisal just to, to, to end our event. And in, in the name of the, in behalf of the center, I really appreciate the participation from all of you. Thank you. And Doug, you are raising your hand. Yes. Yeah, I was going to briefly mention that our next Agile Peer Exchange is 1 to 5 o'clock on Tuesday, August 4th on cost benefit and TSMNO. So, uh, August? Perhaps, uh, October. <laughs> Sorry, I thought I said I thought I said October. My brain's someplace else. Yes, October fourth, uh, one o'clock to five o'clock on cost benefit methodologies and TSMNO. Right, thank you, Doug, and um, thank you everyone for joining us today. And um, I think um, we learned a lot. Uh, what my take, big takeaway from this is that we got a quick snapshot of uh, the state of practice. Thank you again uh, for our, from our friends from. Norway to, to give an excellent presentation. So we even got some international flavor to this peer exchange, which was very helpful. Um, the materials uh, that were shared today will be shared through our website in coming days. And um, again, you know, we'll remind you about uh, the Road Weather Management Spotlight webinar series. Uh, our next one is, uh, the next webinar is on October 12th. Please uh, sign up if you have interest. And, um, Finally, you know, we have huge resources on our website. We have about 2,200 resources available through on variety of dismal topics. So please visit our website. And also, if in case you are not subscribed to our newsletter, we invite you to sign up to receive a newsletter. We provide uh, uh, updates on our events, and uh, we also touch upon uh, some of the dismal developments uh, through our newsletter. So I've sent the link through the chat so for the newsletter as well. Thank you so much again, and uh, we will uh, continue. This is an important topic. Uh, we will regroup with Federal Highway, take the input from um, from today, and um, and then uh, we'll uh, we'll uh, reach out to, to you as well. Please uh, provide uh, information on the on what your thoughts are on this agile format. That will be very helpful to us. We'll take it back to our technical advisory committee and um, look into improving our services in the future, like Doug said. With that, we are adjourned and uh, thank you again. <laughs>